I yeah, I'm going to hand it over to Tammy. Tammy's going to introduce Dr. Hansen this morning. Oh, sorry, I forgot That's about okay. that. Okay, no worries. Excellent. And I have the complete and utter joy of introducing this incredible lady, Dr. Katherine Hansen. She'll be sharing on the topic of creating work and a life that aligns with your core values. You and your family partner can both serve the greater, greater good. And in this session, Dr. Katherine Hansen will be sharing on the topic and how you can serve for the greater good, even when your spouses are in the military. She will sh share tips on how you can flourish from where you're planted. After 20 years practicing medicine, Dr. Hansen is expanding beyond the office walls to help women rediscover the inner peace and utter joy of reclaiming life. She has been interviewed by, med by multiple media outlets, runs a woman-to-woman -woman column, shares a re revealing wellness blog, and has created several community and online programs that reach out with powerful, useful, safe, effective health and wellness information for women of all ages and stages of life. Dr. Hansen completed a residency in obstetric and gynecology, followed by a fellowship in sexual health, a certification, a certification in menopause, and a strong alignment with an integrative approach to care. After realizing her strong desire to educate, she completed a Master of Public Health at John Hopkins University and has witnessed life-changing results as a certified transformational coach and facilitator. Married to a Canadian astronaut, Jeremy Hansen, and blessed with three amazing teenagers, the entire family enjoys outdoor life, night swimming, watching for satellite amongst the stars. You can hear more topics and conversation with Dr. Hansen by becoming a member of Dr. Hansen's Global Online Women's Wellness Circle, ewcircle.com, and join her private Facebook group, ewcircle.com slash community. I have, I have had the pleasure of connecting with the Hansen family for the past few years, as she's currently in Houston, Texas, and I'm one of her support uh, systems with MFS. She is driven, compassionate, and very uplifting woman. It is my greatest pleasure to welcome Dr. Katherine Hansen. Thank you so much, Tammy. It's uh, beautiful to be connected with you and with these amazing women uh, who are, first of all, putting this incredible virtual conference on. Um, I'm understanding this is sort of a, a new thing, but man, has it been excellent to listen to the previous speakers, yesterday's speakers, uh, which I'll, I'll actually talk a little bit about as we go through this conversation today and also to all of the people attending. I know it's not easy to carve out time in the day for yourself. And uh, I just, I'm really honored to be here and very excited to be having this conversation. So I believe I, I have control of the slides now. So I want to um, share, uh, you heard my introduction, and I've put on this slide uh, what defines me for this conversation as being the spouse of Colonel Jeremy Hansen, one of only four active Canadian astronauts, and uh, as you can hear in my voice, very, very proud of his work. And as you'll hear through this talk, he as well is as deeply embedded in the success of my work as I am in his, and I think that uh, I think that is the key to what we're talking about uh, here today. So I want to uh, first explain as we go through that I am, and I'll, I'll advance here, I'm Canadian, you'll hear the accent, and I feel right at home with all of you. Uh, I presume many are Canadian, and I, I know you've been sharing where you're living, where you're from. And I am going to encourage a fair amount of chatting, and I am going to keep an eye on the chat because I think it really uh, it helps me to know that uh, what I'm talking about is uh, is landing for you, and also to redirect and course correct the conversation as well. So please go ahead and chat, and uh, I'll try and keep an eye on that. But I want to share first of all. I don't know if we know if there are any men in the audience. And the reason I say that is because I'm speaking as the, from the perspective of a woman, I identify as a woman, and I'm in a relationship with a man. And I know that's not always, <clears throat> that's not always the case. And I want 
I just want to share that the perspective and the verbiage and the communication that you'll hear today, I believe, would land for uh, for a woman in a relation in a relationship with a military member who is also a woman. But I'm not sure about whether it's going to land uh, for a male military spouse. And so I want to be very sensitive to that. So if that is uh, if that is coming up. And I will again uh, redirect and, uh, and alter the conversation. So yeah, I consult for several organizations. This is my uh, this is my military spouse, and our posting is living and working in Houston, Texas, where we've been for the last 10 years, actually, which is longer than a usual posting, um, but carries a lot of those similar challenges. I'd like to take a moment for us to really drop into this space together. I think this is valuable in that we heard from uh, Michelle Darrell yesterday the importance of, uh, of taking time for ourselves. And I know when I give these presentations, it's very tempting when you're not on video to be off doing other things. And I, I really believe uh, that we can elevate the conversation by energetically being all in in this conversation. And so I just ask you to take a couple deep breaths for yourself. Even that moment that we had with Michelle Darrell yesterday was just really, really valuable for us, uh, releasing all those yummy neurotransmitters and hormones that we can access from our own body. And I just ask you to take a couple of really big, deep breaths and set aside all your distractions and to-dos and really be present in this conversation and present with the other women who have, who have, uh, who have shown up to be with us today. So to start, my story, and some of you have seen and heard this before, but my story is uh, it began a long time ago. So I went to Africa and spent about six weeks six weeks working there. And I sort of decided at that point that that's what I wanted to do with my life. And as many of you, uh, that wasn't the case. I ended up meeting uh, and falling in love and marrying this man. And it was interesting in some of, in our first uh, military posting, Northern Alberta and Cold Lake uh, on a fighter base there, uh, I met a woman who said that she was an academic trapped in a military spouse's body. And for the first time, I realized that I wasn't the only one feeling that my calling was not necessarily to be uh, in support and be a military spouse. Not that it wasn't one of the roles and responsibilities that I embraced, but it maybe wasn't my calling. And so we are all a culmination of our life experiences and uh, a lot of us have big dreams. And after marrying this amazing man, we got uh, really overwhelmed with not one, not two, but three children, all under 18 months in a rapid succession at the same time as I was working on call 24 seven as the only OBGYN in uh, Cold Lake, Alberta. And this deer in headlights look that you see uh, in my husband's eyes is probably one that you have noticed in your own spouse's eyes uh, a fair amount of the time when you have young children. We were uh, busy, we were frazzled, there was a lot going on. And I share that because I know the demographic of being a military spouse, him deployed, me home with children, trying to balance work and life and all that goes along with those things. In addition to, and, and I, I'm fairly certain I'm not the only one, in addition to him kind of being out and playing and, and doing what seemed like uh, was a lot of fun at the same time as I was home uh, getting everything in order. So that can create a lot of its own uh, emotion and a lot of its own challenges uh, watching our military spouse doing in a lot of situations doing what they love and also having and bearing their own their own challenges. Uh, in the case of my husband, he uh, the, the story maybe a little long for today is that he came to me in around 2009 after waiting 18 years for an astronaut recruitment. We hadn't had one in 18 years and said, oh, there's, they're calling for a recruitment at the Canadian Space Agency, to which I replied, okay, sure. 5,500 applicants, and they took two, 
uh, and Jeremy was one of those two in 2009. So it, it was a, a blessing in his lifetime to be able to be in the astronaut corps, but at the same time led to you know some some ongoing uh, struggles. <clears throat> and I often tell people there's not not a lot of perks to being an astronaut spouse. There's not a lot of perks to being a military spouse. So we really want to embrace the perks that we do have. So while he was playing and having fun, I call it space camp. Uh, I was being mom and dad, putting worms on hooks and taking the kids out for uh, dinner and breakfast as often as I could. So I didn't have to necessarily do all the cleanup. So that's the struggle and I'm sure you can resonate with a lot of those things and I'm really curious because we learned yesterday you'll hear me come up with some Brene Brown uh, quotes as well that clear is kind and I find that often as a military spouse being able to name the challenges being able to name the emotions being able to be clear and kind with ourselves and also with our spouses because I've been sharing with one of my daughters recently that uh, she she gets upset and she'll she'll sort of shut down and she'll sort of walk away. And I've I've had to call her back in and say, you know, we we can't read your mind. It would be really valuable if you could name what you needed, if you could ask for it. And uh, actually, literally this morning, I went upstairs to grab something from her room, and she's got a quote on her. Uh, dresser, and she, it says from Oprah Winfrey, and I didn't cross-reference this, but it says, you get in life what you have the courage to ask for. And I think that I think that, that is amazing to see my daughter actually acknowledging that. Let's see if it, uh, if it manifests in, in our conversation. But it's true. We get in life what we have the courage to ask for. And so I'd love to uh, I'd love to have you name your challenges. What are your biggest challenges? And you'll notice today that the, the conference has been set up such that yesterday was really tapping into personal growth. And uh, and I'm going to circle back to some of the highlights I took away from the three beautiful messages yesterday. And today we're talking about professional growth. We're talking about growing where you're planted. And so we can talk about whatever we want to in this time. It's our time together. Um, but what are your challenges around bringing your best to your professional life or creating and, and, and uh, germinating in your professional life? Self-compassion, believing in your worth. Yeah, and believing in your worth as a professional, for sure. Those are those are some challenges, and I'd love to hear more. So go ahead and and uh, share if you can name what it is that makes it so hard for us as military spouses to really blossom and grow. And uh, are we feeling like, let's say, academics trapped in military spouse bodies, working from home, isolation? Absolutely. So that sense of being isolated. Um, working from home because it's often what we choose to do, uh, and we'll I'll also be circling back to why that may be the case. So how to feel successful when things change, right? And so as you as you change deployments, as you change location, as the dynamic shifts in your family, as maybe children go off to school or you have to renegotiate different schools then uh, it becomes really hard for us because of those continual transitions. We can't necessarily do exactly what we did before. And in some cases, it's nice to leave something that maybe wasn't working. And in other cases, as we heard from um, Michelle McIsaac yesterday, it's really hard to leave something you love and to regrow, as you say, I'm continuing to read the chat, lovely, reinvent and regrow in, in new locations. Lack of career progression, absolutely. Um, and, and again, feeling isolated, dedicating time to our career when we're solo parenting. So when our partners are off uh, training and on deployments or at base camp, and I say that uh, tongue in cheek because I know he's working very hard, uh, we aren't necessarily on that career ladder. And again, Michelle McIsaac referred to that as well, not wanting to start at the bottom every time, putting dreams on hold, Competing priorities, right? Because our family is our priority, and we know that to be the case. 
Um, but there are competing priorities and trying to balance those, not, not leaving ourselves off the list. Online courses, yeah, we're going to come back around to a lot of the uh, solutions that I see also coming up. And I love the conversation that we're having because we're taking it from uh, a place of being generative and solution oriented and and realizing that these challenges are real, that we're not alone in them, and that there is a way forward. I have a friend who often uses the term, this is figure outable, and these things are figure outable. So today and, and last night, uh, with I, I'm not even going to be able to put words to what we heard from Monica Bobbitt last night. So powerful, just so intense and powerful and landed so deeply for me. But I loved where she said, we make a choice. Um, and, and even in the situation uh, that she was in and losing her spouse, to be able to come around to a place where she can say, we make a choice, and that thriving is an active, fluid process. So we're going to talk today about thriving, keeping in mind that it is an active and fluid process. We're going to talk today about the world we live in, about the rise of women and our role in the big picture. We're going to talk about creating context for your seeds to germinate and grow and how you can truly blossom and making this as personal for you as possible. So it's not our grandmother's world. So my grandmother is a military spouse my mom's mom, and I used to call her regularly when I first uh, married my husband. I, I called her regularly throughout my life, but when I first married my husband, I would call her. I had three kids running around, three kids under 18 months. So you can imagine as they grew, three toddlers, three in diapers at the same time. I was, again, 24-7 on call trying to cover the OBGYN service for a catchment area of probably 200,000 with a military spouse that, while he would not admit it, was deployed 50% of the time. He would never say, oh, I'm never, I'm not away that much. So I started marking it on the calendar. Anybody done that? I would mark it on the calendar. And when I actually went to count it, I could prove it to him that it was 50% of the time. And I would call her and I would uh, just share how challenging this was. And she would say to me, well, you're a military spouse. What do you expect? And I think we heard that yesterday, too, uh, from Michelle Matizek, where she was saying that she often got that answer with, you chose this. And having compassion for the fact that, yes, we chose this, but <laughs> it's also very difficult. And I, I remember my grandmother really deflating me in those times because um, there, that wasn't a solution. And what I think is really empowering for us to be considering today is that this is not our grandmother's world anymore for so many reasons. And for the first time, and I'm going to unpack each of these reasons, but it's not our grandmother's world anymore. Uh, for the first time, generationally, if we imagine the generations of women that have gone before us, this is the first generation truly where we have within our grasp the opportunity to reach higher, to improve ourselves, to ultimately, uh, as Maslow would say, to ultimately self-actualize. We have the resources, we have the capacities, we have the potential, we have ourselves freed up from what previous generations were not freed up from in terms of survival and feeding our family. And a lot of the time, previous generations have had to focus on those basics, uh, on, high, on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, those basics of survival. And for us, those basics in general, for most of us in this conversation, and this is not a global thing, this is very much in the Western world and in this conversation, for most of us, putting food on the table is not the high, not the, not of, of, um, really, it's not something that we, in our current situation, are having to focus on minute by minute. Um, and it's amazing to me how recent it was that that was the case. And, and uh, my parents come and stay with me for long periods of time here in Texas. And I was making something for dinner recently. 
And my mom was sharing with me, uh, I think I was making tea biscuits, and my mom was sharing with me how her mother, so my grandmother that I was just referring to, used to make tea biscuits and broth. And because there was flour and water and butter, she could make those, and that's what she would make on payday or on just past, just before payday when they didn't get paid yet um, because that's what she could afford to feed her family of six. Um, and so I, I digress a little bit just to realize that we are in this generation and have access to these resources for the first time historically. And that makes our generation and the opportunities in front of us so much more profound. And so we're creating this life for ourselves inside a worldview that is very different from the outdated worldview of our of our uh, grandparents, of our grandmothers, let's say. So let's unpack these a little bit. It's not a man's world anymore. And so a lot of us have had to function and had to succeed in a masculine paradigm, myself included, in the world um, in the world I've lived in, in the medical community, which is ex which has been male dominated until um, very recently, it's very important that it, the value in my worth at work would come from those masculine traits and characteristics: being directional, being laser focused, being task oriented, being achievement oriented, climbing the ladder. All of those things were valued and were exceptionally important to success. And now. We're realizing, and I'm going to continue unpacking this, that the traits that we as women are innately good at are becoming more and more valuable in the world. So we li we're living in a world where we can create more from the feminine if we can if we can reignite and retap into those characteristics we can start to create from those perspectives. And our greatest strengths are now the most important strengths in the world that we live in. So we're moving from an industrial age into an information age. And we know that because the information that is coming at us is coming at greater pace and acceleration than ever before. So in our in our parents age in the industrial age and generations before us it was important to get a job it was important to stay in that job retire from that job and a lot of times our military spouses are still living in that paradigm um, and retiring from the same job but in most cases the world over that's not the case anymore we're we're really recreating what it means to be to have a career and to fulfill on our passion and purpose and we're doing it inside this new worldview that is um, ever changing at, at breakneck speed and the world is more connected than it's ever been before so in this new world of connectivity pretty much every job we can imagine is going to be virtual at some point. And so as military spouses, and I see a lot of people who are sharing that they work from home or they're, or they're recreating their work, we're ahead of the curve in that we have, um, we have it's, sort of, it's sort of imposed on us to be recreating in this place of uh, unprecedented connectivity. So the internet and uh, artificial intelligence are just changing the world uh, to an entirely different view. And because of those things, because of the way information is coming at us, because we're now connected the world over, we can decide to share something on the other side of the world and they're gonna get it in seconds. And um, because of those things, we the world is unpredictable. And so we know that organizations are not making long-term plans because of the unpredictability that is the current landscape. And I'm just, I'm loving to take in, take in some of this tune uh, because multitasking uh, is, is actually not a great thing to be doing, but I am loving to be involved in this, uh, in the conversations that are going on. So definitely keep them coming. And the unpredictability of it is uh, the way I can sort of articulate that and drive it home is that I believe, my husband believes, in his lifetime, he will see people on Mars. So we know we're going back to the moon 
and we know from the moon the next step is Mars, and we know that we have um, the technology and the technology is advancing so quickly that very likely in our lifetime, we're gonna take people off of the planet into deep space and potentially to asteroids or Mars. And the whole thought of that happening and when that happens, what does that change for us? In artificial intelligence, I don't know what it's like in your houses, but theory runs my house. And uh, I can tell her pretty much anything and she'll, she'll do it for us all the way to closing the garage doors and all the lights and the alarm systems and all of those things. It's pretty impressive. And my kids get into bed now and they use Alexa to set their, uh, actually Alexa's gonna start talking to me in a second beside me here. They use her to set their alarm and to give them reminders that they have tra tra track practice and what they need to take to school. And it's pretty, pretty amazing. And my husband, no matter where he is in the world, and currently he has not left the planet, although he will be the next Canadian to do so. Um, it's a very, very exciting prospect for us and uh, the date yet to be determined, the location in space yet to be determined. Um, but no matter where he is in the world, he orders our pizza for pizza and movie night on Friday night. And whether he's in Russia or Japan or I'm um, assuming International Space Station, ordering pizza for us is one of his gifts of service. But it just highlights the importance of what's happening in the world and how quickly things are changing. And in those, if, as those things change, mindset will absolutely need to shift. And what we know to be currently in the feminine, and it doesn't just mean women, it means feminine, we'll call them feminine or soft skills in men as well, will become much more highly valued. And we know that job uh, organizations already who have women in leadership roles have greater ROI, greater return on investment at in every measurable outcome, including financial. And why is that? It's because of the greater connection, the greater teamwork, the greater conflict resolution, greater communication skills, greater flexibility, greater creativity and innovation around uh, bringing new ideas. And so we know that this, the prospect of what is coming in the world is going to continue to elevate the qualities that we as women innately bring to those organizations and to, the, to that work. And we also know uh, Leah Weiss's work. Uh, Leah Weiss has written a book. Um, I will make sure that we, I think it's called How We Work. And uh, her work shares with us that in the MBA programs of all the big universities uh, in the States, they're now bringing, they're not teaching these soft skills, the, the, the skills that we as women already have the capacity to tap into in most cases. Those are our superpowers. I love this. I'm going to hopefully, Joanna, I'll be able to get a copy of the chat. I know sometimes that's hard, but it, it just, it's so profound to be looking over at that conversation. You will. Okay. Awesome. 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 All right. And so as we heard uh, Michelle McIsaac mention yesterday that, and I found this so liberating, that she at some level defines herself by what she does as an, as an incredible social worker. And I've always been sort of careful to define myself by what I do, um, and not because I didn't want to, but because I felt like, well, is that really who I am? And it's so interesting that uh, we have so many definitions of ourselves. And so I found it liberating and, I, and, uh, and empowering that she would share that yesterday. And so who am I? I am not just, uh, I am an astronaut, astronaut wife and mother, and I do resonate with the word wife. So I use it, spouse, partner, whatever feels good for you. I'm an obstetrician gynecologist, a menopause provider, founder of the Empowered Women's Circle, coach, facilitator, leader, speaker, all of those things. And I think it behooves us as women, as we tap into those inner places of ourselves, that we actually reflect on how we define who we are and give ourselves permission to define ourselves 
as as what we do, as what we offer, and as really truly who we are and what those what those superpowers are that we bring to the world. And how do you define success? And what does that mean when we're playing the infinite game? So we know that leadership uh, is what the definition of leadership is changing. And I will I will circle back to that. But we know that as the world shifts and as the unpredictability of the world and the increased connectivity of the world and the information comes at us, what allows us to really, really shift our worldview is leaders, and I'll come back to how you're all leaders in your own life, but leaders who are valuing the infinite game, who are valuing the greater good more than their own self-interest. And in any huge world shift that has ever occurred, that has been the case where leaders have stepped forward with the big picture in mind, as opposed to any sense of personal power or their own personal gain. And so success is, the word success and the definition of success is really changing. And I, and I ask us as we have this conversation to reflect on what that means. Yeah, Simon Sinek, exactly. Uh, and I'll, I'll circle back to make sure I, I have uh, mentioned all these visionary leaders that we're hearing about over the last couple of days. So the operating system of the 21st century is absolutely feminine. We know that Desmond Tutu and the Dalai Lama, other visionary leaders around the world have said this, that it will be the Western woman, because of the reasons and the resources available that we've just talked about, it'll be the Western woman who ultimately augments and catalyzes that shift in our worldview. And so whether you're a man or a woman, being able to really tap into these qualities that we have uh, previously called feminine qualities or soft skills is going to be vital in this time of change. And the good, good news is you already have access to those, to those superpowers as a woman. So talking about the rise, so we talked about the world we live in. It's not our grandmother's world anymore. Now we're going to shift to the rise of women and our role in the big picture. So along with the rise in the value of feminine qualities we inherently possess, there is a rise of women. Women have momentum. So you only need to look at U.S. politics and the Me Too movement and some of the visionary leaders, Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu that I just talked about, you only need to look at those things to realize that there is a disruption that's occurring. And women are absolutely on the rise. And we're defining a new paradigm of leadership and what, and what leadership means. So the possibilities for women are unprecedented. The resources available to us are essentially limitless. And what this means is that if you can dream it, you can create it. And I love this. Yes, we have been given great responsibility. So in today's world, we can have, be, and do anything we want. And we will, in a moment, come back to what may be holding us back. But yet many of us feel unfulfilled. And this is something that I acknowledge I see a lot in my office where uh, women are generally yearning for something and they're looking externally for a quick fix or something that will soothe or nurture them when in fact what we've been talking about yesterday and today is that we do our own self-soothing and we heard a couple of amazing ways for us to, to dig into that with Michelle Darrell's uh, description and, and explanation and tools and resources around self-care and uh, Michelle McIsaac talking to us about attachment theory and how we can really be nurturing ourselves in community and in relationships. So what is holding us back ultimately is ourselves and how is that, how is it that we are doing that? Well, it has a lot to do with how we think and we have about 60,000 thoughts a day and for some reason or another, 
80% of them are negative. Why is that? It's because we focus on the negative. So um, Marcy Shemoff is, an, is another one of these uh, women that I just love reading and, and talking to. I've actually met her. Uh, she wrote Happy for No Reason. She says, if you get 10 compliments and one criticism, what are you going to focus on? You're going to focus on that criticism. And sometimes we're defining ourselves um, we're looking for self-esteem, which is actually conditional on us accomplishing or doing something, versus self-love, which is more about loving ourselves regardless, that unconditional love that we seek from other people. And if we can provide that to ourselves, some of the ways that uh, Michelle gave us yesterday to really tap into that self-love. And why are we focusing on the negative? Well, because it used to be that we had to. There was a big predator coming into the village or there was something that was going to take our life. It was life or death, fight or flight, but it's not anymore. And by these thoughts and living in this milieu of um, always being focused on the negative, we're creating an environment for ourselves that's not accurate because it's usually not fight or flight, death, life or death usually something like a text that had an overtone that wasn't pleasant or uh, um, not having the right groceries in the house and not creating stress. And it's also, it's also not pleasant for us to be sitting in that milieu. And physically, and uh, th it, that's beyond the scope to, of what we're talking about today, but physically, what happens with those neurotransmitters and hormones when we're sitting in fight or flight is absolutely hazardous ravaging to our health. So more on that another day when we uh, circle back around to uh, the physical health topics. So asking yourself now, how are you living? So there's these two edges. Are you living in this self-sacrificing place where you're in lack and you're in scarcity, you're responsible for everyone, you're leaning into perfectionism, you're either suppressing your voice or overcompensating with abrasiveness. We all know people who are like that, where they're um, defensive or they're coming out stronger than they really need to be just to overcompensate, um, hiding in the shadows or living in fear of not being good enough versus this place of self-giving where we're in abundance and love, honoring ourselves. And I love this, being the authority on our life, setting an example for our family. This is where we can be passionate and dynamic and wild and crazy and tapped into all those beautiful feminine qualities, taking what we need, taking the time that we need with absolutely nothing to prove. And in a nutshell, this is really what it means to live from a place of love versus living from a place of fear. And every time we step over what we need and we're, and we're not filling our own needs, we're creating and we're um, emphasizing some sense of insecurity because we're not taking care of ourselves. And I believe a lot of that is rooted in what we heard from Michelle McIsaac yesterday in terms of you can get that love and nurturing from your community, from, from the people you grew up with, from your community, from the people around you. You can also get that from yourself by really tapping into that self-soothing and self-nurturing and coming from that place of love. And we also heard yesterday how a lot of this um, living out of fear or constriction, being detached emotionally can come out in physical ailments. And uh, as an OBGYN, I see that all the time. And it's so vital that we understand that a lot of the physical concerns that, that women are presenting with, and especially around midlife is where we see this a lot, is based a lot in how we are treating ourselves. And, uh, and we can explain that physiologically with a lot of what's going on uh, on a neurotransmitter and hormone level just because we're stressed and we're in fear. So making sure that we know what it feels like in your body to be living from love and, and, and abundance as opposed to living from fear and scarcity. And to be able to rethink. So it's not just sugarcoating our thoughts. It's not just saying, okay, I can do this um, and overlaying positive thoughts all the time. It's really digging down deep into those false beliefs that we carry around 
not just personally, but personally is where we do the work, but also collectively, culturally, and to be able to replant our garden. So figuring out what those false beliefs may be. Do we feel like we're not enough? Do we feel less than? Do we feel not worthy? Do we feel invisible? And how is how are those beliefs feeding those thoughts that are ultimately creating the environment we're living living in and the emotions that come from that environment? And when we're able to do this, Probably, and we, we practiced this yesterday with uh, one of the Michelles, um, to be able to sit quietly with ourselves and tap into some of the underlying beliefs that are, that are leading to our emotions and our actions. And one of the biggest things we've heard, and I'll reiterate, that we can do for ourselves is have a relaxation practice, to have a wellness practice, a well-rounded wellness practice, but really important to have a relaxation practice once a day, a quiet environment, a comfortable position, and just focus the, focusing on a calming bird thought or intention and our breath and being open and non-judgmental. And what this can do for your body, for your mind, for your soul, and ultimately for your belief and acceptance and acknowledgement that there is a better way to think or, or uh, to have that growth mindset, which we're also going to talk about, um, is, is the absolute best place to start to uh, be able to tap into those inner beliefs and thoughts that, are, that we're carrying around. And that's where the zone of magic starts to happen, when we really sit with ourselves and reflect on what is possible for us. And it was beautiful the way these, these talks have aligned because uh, Michelle Darrell is providing you, and I know she mentioned it in the chat, she's providing you with an actual exercise from Brene Brown, I believe, to dig into your core values. How, what are your core values? Does your life reflect those values? How does it feel when you're functioning aligned with those values versus off track? And recognizing how it feels in your body when you're living aligned with your core values versus misaligned and, and being able to do that course correction because that is the GPS that ultimately guides our guides our work and how we're recreating and developing our work. And in the Empowered Women's Circle, those core values are what root us as we extend toward the vision. And this is the graphic you're welcome to steal and use. It's, uh, it's the, basically the steps that we use in the Empowered Women's Circle, rooting into those core values and reaching up for that vision, that GPS, that North Star, and using a wellness practice and some accountability in order to get there. And I share that because I think it's a valuable visual in terms of how we can root in those values um, and then reach to that vision, which may very well be your work in the world. So how do we get out of our own way? We talked about the, the rewiring of our brain and um, we talked about recreating and having that self-care and that self-love. But ultimately, it comes down to a couple of things that really shift the way we are being in the world. The growth mindset, embracing our confidence and our expertise, and then filling in those gaps and that balancing act of authentic confidence, which is not being too much and not feeling less than to kind of do that balancing act, which we never get right. I'll be perfectly honest with you, we never get it right. Um, and we don't have to, and that's the beauty. That's the beauty of it. So growth mindset is to show up empty-handed, open-hearted, and curious, to be in relationship to our life experiences so that every situation, whether it's a success or a breakdown, is a catalyst to our power. So we know that being authentically confident is not about being certain. So leadership and power in the old paradigm, in the old world, is, is or, or was being certain or at least acting certain all the time. And 
what I'd like to highlight in this new paradigm is that leadership and confidence don't come from becoming certain. They come from shifting our relationship with uncertainty. So being okay with not having all the answers, but embracing the things we do know. And so this is a place that women will often sell themselves short is that we underestimate ourselves. We don't embrace our expertise and our confidence. So we think that because of the way power has, and leadership have been defined previously, we think, well, if we don't know everything, then we don't deserve to be authentically confident or to be leaders. And this is absolutely not true anymore. If you know any great leaders, you and, and we heard from Stuart yesterday in this conference, you will see that it is not about knowing everything. It's about being able to admit we don't know everything and being okay with that and being always on the edge of our growth so that we're constantly um, accepting and celebrating what we do know and then filling in the gaps and being okay with not knowing everything and, and developing that uh, from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset and that relationship with being uncertain. And that I think is probably the biggest, the biggest growth edge. We've often lived in a world where it hasn't been safe as women to own our power and to embrace our confidence. And as women, it's so important for us to be shifting that. And that's what we're doing in this conversation. We have, we are worthy of taking up space and we are worthy of having a voice. And it's so important that we do that. And there's no question in my mind that those of you in this conversation have enough authentic confidence, leadership skill, enough certainty about the things that you know well, that you know enough to get started. So if you're feeling like, well, I just don't know where to start, I am absolutely certain that you have what you need to get started and then to continually grow into the the new skill sets and the new uh the new area of your work so in your professional life and your personal life and it's amazing to me uh, that my husband he's a great role model for me in so many ways he's always filling in gaps he's exceptionally transparent and honest about the areas that he doesn't do well and that's one of his greatest strengths because he can have the insight into seeing what he doesn't do well and then fill in those gaps. If you've ever been in a debrief um, for the pilot, it's, uh, it's an amazing experience to watch how they really are open and honest about all the things that they don't do well. And as women, just as we have trouble embracing and really having a voice and, and um, and owning our power, we also beautifully have incredible insight into what we don't do well. And we're willing to be, in most cases, vulnerable, open, honest, and transparent about the things we don't do well. And that is a superpower for women. That is a strength because we can then come around and say, okay, this is an area that maybe I don't have the capacity to perhaps build a business from home or I don't have um, what it takes to start in this new organization where I'm now relocated to. And we realize if we don't have those skills and we have insight into not having them, we go and learn them. We reach out for resources and support so that we can go and learn those different things and really step into and expand into those roles. So you decide, we've heard this already, you decide by choosing to shift your perspective on where you source your power, you get to cultivate and co-create your future. And you have a purpose, and we've heard this already. You have a purpose. And I, I know when I see women, which is very often in the office around midlife, it's difficult to know what creates that restlessness or that um, readiness to do something different. And it could be being a military spouse being relocated. It could be having children. It could be our children leaving the nest. It could be menopause and hormone related. We're not really sure. But whatever it is, uh, there's a, 
there's often a yearning in life for us to tap into those whispers that we're hearing. And I, I would suggest if you're starting to hear those whispers, it's your time to start really looking at what it is that you're here to do. And we can unpack that a little bit as we start to close here. So the world needs your gifts, and I want to just highlight that. If you're feeling like, well, I don't really know, I'm not really sure, well, it's time to start digging those up. Because as we, as we shift into this new paradigm of leadership and the balance of power, we can actually catalyze change. And as military spouses, it's amazing to me what, we, uh, what possibility there is for us to actually ripple this leadership and this influence into the world. You're already doing it by virtue of living in different locations and influencing different people. We, know, we now know that most people influence about a thousand other people, and that's without even trying. So yes, the world needs your gifts, and I'm reading that right out of the chat. The world needs your gifts, and, um, and if we influence a thousand people, and each of those thousand people influence another thousand people, and I know with what the MFS is doing, the, the outreach is influencing way more than a thousand people. We can just exponentially see the growth, and what does it take for us to say, it's my time, it's my responsibility. I'm going to be a leader in my own life at the very least and step into this new relationship with uncertainty and know that I'm never going to get it right in 100%, but I'm going to get started. What is that? What is that for you? And what is that going to take? So creating a context for you. So have you ever felt like a square peg in a round hole? And I have a feeling we all have. That's why we're having this conversation. I love that, the chat, the whispers get louder the older you get, absolutely. And the filters go off the older you get, too. I turned 50 this year, and it's amazing. We were talking about that in one of the other conversations last year, or sorry, yesterday, in one of the other conversations about, um, about age and how uh, it's, it's important to embrace that and to ex accept the wisdom and the life experience and the, the um all the all the all the experiences and education that comes with that life and really being grateful for it. So yesterday Michelle McIsaac was sharing about how she wasn't really sure what to do after the move and she created her clinic. She said, I think her words were, I dug deep and I and I created the clinic. And so that is sometimes what it takes for us to really be able to express our greatest gift, to step outside our comfort zone on our own terms, not our family's terms. I love it. I love that um, from the chat again. So creating context for our potentials to be realized. So thinking about these questions, and we're not gonna be able to answer all of them today, but I am going to provide you with a worksheet, sort of a journal prompt, that's gonna include this information so that it will tweak your thoughts around the answers to some of these questions. What are your greatest gifts? Are they something you want to turn into a livelihood? Do people need those gifts? Have you actually seen them land and help people? And is there a way to deliver them in your current situation? And with the world moving faster than it ever has before and being more connected than it ever has before, then there's so much opportunity for us to share those gifts and to be in a growth mindset that you don't have to have it perfectly right away. And so how can you truly blossom? And it's going to be difficult for each of us. And I'd like you to, just for a moment, really feel it in your body. Imagine your life so aligned with your core values, expressing your greatest gifts, and ask yourself, Again, open-hearted, curious, open-minded, with a growth mindset, what do I need to do? What resources do I need? And I know that the MFS is already providing so many of these resources, places you can reach out for support. And if you've ever read um, uh, books, I'm thinking of uh, Live and Grow Rich as one of them that we've read with our kids, the importance of emotionalizing your desires, not being shut down and constricted that, well, I'll never have this, but being really open and allowing yourself to touch, feel, smell, and taste 
what it is that you yearn for in expressing those gifts. And so the worksheet, which um, I literally just created as a summary from this slide set uh, just before we went live, we will have available to you at ewcircle.com slash MFS. So you can uh, go there at the end and I'll circle back to give you that uh, website. And I know that Joanna and the crew will make sure you have that available to you as well. And I wanted to share, because it is so timely, that I have this program starting next week and I wish I could say that I was smart enough to plan it this way. I wasn't. This just happens to be coming up next week and I think it's really vital um, because of the conversation that I'm seeing and the needs that I hear uh, coming through in, in this conversation yesterday and today, that this program that I'm running is a five-week program run virtually, which makes it accessible. And I think a lot of what we're hearing is that need to be connected and in community with like-minded women who are really putting themselves on the list maybe for the first time, although I get a feeling that a lot of us in this conversation have been working at this and working at ourselves for a while. And this is a five-week program focused on physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual wellness. I'm really talking about the concepts that I've talked about today, laying them on a foundation of wellness and, and continually focusing on what it is that you personally want to achieve. So we heard about we heard from, I love being able to reflect uh, for women, their superpowers. And so when we, when we heard from Michelle Daryl yesterday, uh, I was really struck with, I felt like I was getting a big, huge permission slip to give myself self-love and self-care. And I think that, that Michelle's superpower is just being able to roll out the red carpet for us and to, to give us the permission we need to really pour self-love into ourselves, and that, that is a superpower. And uh, Michelle McIsaac yesterday, it's interesting to listen to we were doing three M's yesterday. Um, I was out for a run when I was listening to her conversation, and I, I don't, I really can't articulate how this happened, but I really felt her love, and I've never met Michelle McIsaac, and I hope I do uh, one day very soon, but her superpower was extending love. You know, you can share in the chat what you were grateful for for yesterday's presentations, but I felt love. I was out for a run, I was listening, and there was an absolute love being extended um, in that conversation that I could palpably feel, and that is an absolute superpower. And then, of course, um, Monica's presentation last night to take such intense grief and be able to, by some, uh, by, by articulating it the way she did, to really motivate us to do our own lives better is an absolute superpower. And so I, it's been reflected to me that one of the superpowers that I bring is being able to take these concepts and really make them tangible and practicable in a structure in uh, people's lives. And so that's why I wanted to make sure that you know that this program, which is starting next week, is available and that all of the, and I'm going to circle back to this, all of the uh, early bird discounts and bonuses are still on the table so that you know you can still get in there. Um, and I'll share that right at the very, very end. So this is because, and I, and I think this is important as we're creating our life and expressing our gifts, that it's not a one-way road and that in true self-actualization, it's about contributing and having our gifts land, actually making a tangible contribution in someone's life. And so that's why I want to make sure that anybody that wants to be involved uh, in the program or in the work that we're doing in our free uh, global community circle, knows that, that that's the value that we bring is being able to really see that work expressed in someone's life. For them, not just to hear their gratitude, but to actually see their life changed and up-leveled by what we are doing with them. And I know that that's the case for all of the women who are speaking with you over the uh, next couple of days. 
So let me close with um, a kudos to a few of the people I've mentioned and a few references that I've made along the way. Simon Sinek, for sure, Leah Weiss, Kristen Ness, uh, who is the world's guru, I believe, in self-compassion, Brene Brown, and both Kristen Neff and Brene Brown uh, living, residing, and working here in Texas. And um, Claire Zamet, founder of Feminine Power. So Claire has said, make becoming who you were meant to be the organizing principle of your life. And I love that. Make who you were meant to be, make becoming who you were meant to be the organizing principle of your life. Because really, what else is there? You, you do you. One of our Canadian astronauts will often say that, uh, Jenny Sider, she'll say, you go do you. And it's so inspiring. And my husband's out doing him. And uh, I, love, I love this because, of course, he's pointing at his Canadian flag. And he's so proudly wearing his uh, Canadian ship. <laughs> and uh, it's beautiful that as I support him and he supports me, we get to watch each other really step into the best versions of ourselves. And that ultimately is what this relationship is um, all about. Here's my kids all grown up. And I like to be reminded uh, with this slide at this point that we are role modeling. So we're not just um, responsible for helping to augment, as leaders in our own life, for helping to augment uh, change and cultivate change in the way, in the world perspective, uh, even with a little tiny ripple. I don't want anybody to feel intimidated or overwhelmed by that concept, but even with that little ripple out from us. Um, and I'm reminded by this slide and my grown children that we're role modeling Everything we do, we're influencing for these little legacies that we're leaving, for the little hands and feet that are going out into the world and ultimately carrying on that, that, uh, that influence and that leadership that we're showing them. As I took my girls to school this morning and told them I'd be giving this presentation, they both got just really excited and really proud and really happy and um, they're just, they're, they're so moved by the work that I do with women, and that to me is part of the process, is just watching how my influence has, has uh, rippled over into their lives and, and the excitement around what they may ultimately do with those skills. So we're going to go over to questions now. and. I haven't obviously been able to read the whole chat, so I'll rely on Joanna to throw any specific questions that I may have missed and uh, open it up for all of you. And I'm going to leave some of our um, links here on the last slide while we do.